Welcome to Creation Radio. Now, I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the president of Creation Training Initiative, or CTI. Our mission at Creation Training Initiative is to train up other Christians to be able to speak about biblical creation and biblical apologetics so that they can go out and equip this next generation to stand firm on their faith in Jesus Christ. To help us do this, we have different training courses. For example, we have a basic creation training class for teens and above. We have an advanced creation apologetics class for people who want to take the next step in evangelism and learn how to use presuppositional apologetics. We also have a one-day Christian teacher training class to learn the methods that Jesus used in training others. And we also have our five-day Creation Apologetics Teachers College, which trains you on many different areas on how to be a more effective communicator and teacher on biblical creation. Well, to find out more about these courses, you can go to our website at creationtraining.org. That's creationtraining.org, all one word. Now, what we're going to do in this next series on Creation Radio is go through our basic creation training course. Now, we offer this as a one-day class anywhere in the country, or even outside of the country today. So we're going to go through this course. Now, the course has five different chapters in it. Now, each one of these chapters might take a few radio sessions to get through it. But we're going to go through the entire course, the basic creation training. And the five chapters we have in there that deal with this. Number one is the Bible in time. What does the Bible have to say about the age of the earth and the days of creation? The second chapter will deal with the Genesis flood. Was it really a worldwide flood, local flood? And we'll also throw in there the Tower of Babel. What does that really teach us about our history? The third chapter we're going to talk about will be biblical apologetics. We're going to answer some interesting challenges such as where did Cain get his wife? How could the first three days of creation be real days without the sun? How could Noah have put all those animals on the ark? And maybe even a little bit, what about carbon-14? Then chapter 4, we're going to dismantle the four pillars of evolution. And that will be a very interesting one. And we're going to show you don't have to know much about science to do that. Then finally, the last chapter is called Answering 10 big challenges. So that's what we're going to go through in this next series on Creation Radio. So let's go ahead and get started with our first session here in the basic creation training class, the Bible in time. And what we're going to talk about here in this first session is, did God use evolution? What a topic. Did God use evolution? Well, why is that so important? Well, today there's an awful lot of Christian leaders and Christians sitting in churches today that believe God used evolution. Another way of saying this is, well, maybe God could have used evolution. Well, that's a wrong statement for any Christian to be making. God could have used evolution. Now, why is that a wrong statement? Well, here's the reason. It's not a matter what God could have done. It's a matter of what did he do? And what he did is in the Bible. And there we have our first problem. As Christians, we're too often not starting with the Bible. We're just going with what we have heard somebody else say. We need to have discernment. We need to start with God's Word. Check everything against God's Word. So it's not a matter of what God could have done. So let's take a look at this. To help us understand this whole question, did God use evolution, I'd like to look at five different criteria. Five different criteria that help us draw a firm conclusion did God use evolution or not? So our first criteria will be, why do so many Christians want to believe God used evolution? Our second criteria will be, what does the Bible have to say about God and creation? That should be our starting point right there. Unfortunately for many, it is not. Our third session will be, what is evolution? What does evolution really mean? And our fourth criteria will be, if evolution is true, how do we fit it in the Bible? How much of the Bible do we really have to change in order to clearly understand what God is telling us? And criteria number five will be something called logic. We'll look at the logic of this statement, did God use evolution? So let's get started with criteria number one. Why do so many Christians, including many Christian leaders, want to believe God used evolution? Well, there's quite a few reasons uh, why some of these people want to believe God used evolution. Many have been led to believe that the scientists have proven evolution is true. 
Well, that's a pretty hard thing to do since evolution happened in the past and we don't see it happening today. But many people have been led to believe the scientists have really proved evolution true. So now they have to figure out how do we fit evolution into the Bible? And the second reason is some are just unstudied on the issue and they'll just go out and accept whatever the majority wants to believe. So it ends up being kind of a consensus theology with this group. Another reason is some want to appeal to be more like the world. In other words, they, want, they think they're appealing to be more intellectual by believing in evolution rather than the plain reading of God's Word. Uh, other reasons, some are trying to reinvent the church to be more like the culture. This is where we get our whole ideas of postmodernism or the emergent church. Let's not go with the hard doctrines. We don't even talk about so much the doctrines. We just want to reinvent it, make it easy for everybody to come to church and be happy. Uh, this is what you refer to a lot of times as the seeker-friendly church. Let's not offend anybody out there. Many believe God used evolution because it's all they've ever been taught, all they've ever been taught in school. Not only public schools, but unfortunately, our Christian universities and some of our Christian schools are teaching God used evolution. And finally, some just don't believe this is an issue at all and will just go along with whatever anybody says because it's just not important to them. Now, these are some of the reasons people have bought into the idea that God used evolution. So now let's go to part two, criteria number two in our evaluation, did God use evolution? And this is, what does the Bible teach about God and creation? Now, one of the things we're going to see is that there is a consistent message throughout the entire Bible that God created all things. Let's start with Genesis 1. Genesis 1 clearly teaches God created all things. And then we can turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Now here we are in the Ten Commandments. Now what that means is God wrote this down on the stone tablets himself. And what did God write? For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So right there in the Ten Commandments, God wrote down that he created all things. We can go to Isaiah 42, verse 5. God created all things and he stretched the heavens out. So it created everything in him and stretched the heavens out. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, thou hast created heaven and the earth by thy great power. And it goes on to say, nothing is too hard for him. Are we starting to see a consistent message here? Well, then we can go to Nehemiah, first, chapter 9, verse 6. He made the heavens and everything in them. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. God made everything. Nothing has been made that has not been made by him. There's the Gospel of John. The book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 15. God made all things. Ephesians 3 and 9. God who created all things, now get this, through Jesus Christ. In other words, the Bible teaches Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created. Now, does the word all mean all? Absolutely. Because in this verse, it also says the things that are visible and the things that are not visible. That includes everything. We can go to Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand the worlds were framed or made by the Word of God. And finally, we can even go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. God made all things. We see throughout the entire Bible references to God's creation and that he is the creator of all things. This is not some obscure doctrine. It is easily, easy to read, easy to understand, and it's throughout the entire Bible. It is not an obscure doctrine. Nowhere, absolutely nowhere in the Bible does it teach God used evolution. You cannot find that in the Bible. Now, the Bible even goes one step further. This is good news, this is great. It not only tells us that God's the creator of all things, it tells us how he created everything. Well, that's amazing. Well, how did he create everything? Well, one, we can go to Genesis chapter 1 again, and we see the phrase, and God said. In other words, he spoke it into existence by his great power. In the first chapter of Genesis, we see the phrase, and God said, ten times. It's so obvious what he did. 
But then in Jeremiah 32, 17, tells us he spoke it into existence by his great power. And again, nothing is too hard for him. Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9, he spoke and it all came into existence. We see this consistency. And again, Hebrews 11, 3, the word of God spoke everything into existence. So God spoke it into existence by his great power. He did not need any pre-existing materials. He spoke and it all came to be. Now, why do so many have people have trouble understanding that? It's so plain and easy to read. It's because a lot of people have this mindset. If our scientists can't do it, then neither can God. In other words, we're limiting God to our capabilities. Folks, this is called creating God in our image. This is called idolatry. God can do all things. Let's stop limiting him. Let's stick with his word for what he did and stop trying to change it because we don't like what it says. And then we can turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. Here's another whole aspect of this. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it teaches that all scripture is God breathed. That includes the scriptures where it says God created all things. It also includes the scriptures where it said God spoke everything to existence by his great power. Now a question, does God breathe air? Because if God breathes air, folks, and makes mistakes, then is he really worthy of our worship? See, there's the key. Who is our God? Can he really communicate to us, or does he not know how to communicate his word to us? I believe when we read scripture, it says consistently, he is the creator of all things. That includes the stars, the galaxies, all the planets, and all life forms. That leaves no room for evolution anywhere in the Bible. And then let's take a look at one more. How about Romans 1, 19 and 20? Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us that we don't have an excuse for not believing this. Let me read Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that we are without excuse. What that means is, there's no such thing as an innocent native, and there's no such thing as an excuse for not believing in a greater God. God has made that so plain to us. Everybody in their heart of hearts knows there is a greater God. So now we've looked at the first two, why people believe in evolution. Number two, what does the Bible have to say about God and his creation? Now let's go to criteria number three. What is evolution? What does it really mean? Well, the first thing we need to understand about evolution, it is a philosophy based on a worldview called materialism. That is the ideology that all that exists is mass and energy. There are no gods and no supernatural forces. This is the foundation for evolutionism. No God, no creator God. In other words, everything we see out there came into existence by naturalistic processes and God had nothing to do with it. How can we compromise with an atheistic ideology like that? But yet, so many in the church are doing that. Evolution also requires millions and billions of years. In other words, long ages are the holy grail of evolution. Evolution also means that all creatures, including humans, evolved from a common ancestor over millions of years. Evolution also teaches us that the fossil record is a record of, of dead things and decay over millions and millions of years. Now, when we talk about evolution, I'm not talking about variety within kind. The word we sometimes hear for that is microevolution. Well, that is not evolution at all. That is nothing more than variety within kind. That happens because of the information that's already in our DNA. See, the information in our DNA allows us to adapt to our environments. It allows us to vary within kind. We see that within the human species right alone. We see it in the dog kind. We see it in every other kind. The ability to vary within kind. Our ability to adapt. 
For example, if we were to go to a high mountain, let's say Pikes Peak, about 14,110 feet high. If we were to go to the top of Pikes Peak and run around for a little bit, we would get very, very tired very fast. Why is that? Because the air is so thin up there. But if we were to stay up there for several months, our body would adapt to the thinner air. Now that's not evolution. That's called the information in our DNA allows us to do that. Not evolution at all. When we talk evolution here, we're talking what we commonly hear is macroevolution or Darwinian evolution. That is a fish growing legs, going out in the land and eventually becoming a reptile. Or a reptile growing feathers and becoming a bird or an ape-like creature becoming a human being. That's what we mean by evolution here, not our ability to adapt or variety within kind. So when we talk about evolution, we're talking about everything evolving from a common ancestor and things called billions and billions of years of time, which are necessary for the evolution model. So now we've had, why do people want to believe in evolution? What does the Bible have to teach about God and creation? And third, what is evolution? What does it mean? So now that we have a little bit of an understanding of evolution, what would happen if we were to fit that into the Bible? And that brings us to criteria number four. How much of the Bible do we have to reinterpret or change if we put evolution into the Bible? So if God used evolution, that would mean the plain reading of Scripture can no longer be understood. What are we to do with all those scriptures that clearly teach God created all things? Not one of them would mean what it really says. We've got to change every one of those. What does it mean when it teaches God created everything by speaking it into existence? Well, that doesn't mean that either. What are we going to do with the scriptures in Genesis 1 where it teaches God created in six days and it actually defines the days to be days in there? Well, those can't be true either. What does it mean in Exodus 20, verse 11, when God wrote down himself on the stone tablets that he created everything in six days? Well, that wouldn't mean that either. So there now go the Ten Commandments. They don't mean what they say. They're open to our opinions. Also, if God used evolution, we now lose our foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now this is really getting important. What do we mean by this? If we add evolution into the Bible, we lose the gospel. Well, let's take a look at what the Bible teaches without changing anything. Let's just take it for what it says. In Genesis 1, it starts off with God created everything. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. And on day six, he created man, Adam and Eve. Then comes the fall, and then comes death. That is the exact order the Bible reads. We didn't change a thing there. But now, if we want to bring this concept of evolution into the Bible, what's going to have to change here? Well, one of the things we have to bring in is long ages, millions and billions of years, and we have to insert those into the Bible somewhere. So here's how the Bible would now read. Over millions and millions and millions of years, God's creation went on. Finally, he comes along and we have Adam and Eve. And then comes the fall. I have a question here. What would have been going on for those millions of years before Adam and Eve came on board? And the answer is millions of years of death, struggle, decay, and disease. Folks, when we bring evolution into the Bible, we are now teaching death before sin. And I thought the Bible is very clear. As it says in Romans 5.12, death came through one man. So we have a clear problem now with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Genesis 1.31. In Genesis 1.31, God has just finished his creation and he calls everything very good. Now, what does God's very good mean? Well, if we bring evolution to all this, that means we have millions and millions of years of death, the struggle, and disease, and God calls that very good. See, this now affects the very character of God. We've not only destroyed the foundation for the gospel, now we're going after and changing the character of God. He just called death, decay, and disease very good. And then finally, how about Jesus? What did he have to say about this? Well, we can turn to the gospel of Mark. Mark 10, verse 6. In Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus Christ makes this statement. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. What is Jesus telling us? Jesus is telling us 
that man and woman were on this planet from the beginning of creation, not after millions of years. If we're believing in evolution, we're really saying Jesus Christ got it wrong here. And folks, if Jesus got it wrong here, maybe he's not God. And if he's not God, then he's not our Savior. And without a Savior, folks, we are still dead in our sins. This is what evolution really means. Now, let's go to the fifth, fifth part. Fifth criteria, logic. Now, in logic, we have laws of logic. One of those laws is called the law of non-contradiction. Now, the law of non-contradiction basically teaches this. Two opposites both can't be true at the same time in the same circumstance. In other words, as you're sitting out there, you cannot both be there and not there at the same time. It is illogical to believe that. So what I'd like to do is compare God's order of creation with what evolutionists teach about their worldview. Well, let's start in Genesis. In Genesis, God creates the earth on day one and the stars on day four. Notice the order, earth first, then stars. But the evolution worldview teaches stars evolve first, then the earth. These two are opposite in order. They both can't be true. Then we can turn to birds and reptiles. God created the flying creatures on day five, the birds, and the land animals, which includes reptiles, on day six. So the Bible teaches birds came first, then reptiles. But the evolution worldview teaches reptiles came first, then came birds. That is the opposite again. The Bible teaches God played created the plants on day three and the stars on day four. Notice the order, plants, then stars. The evolution worldview teaches stars came first, then came the plants. Those are opposite. The Bible also teaches that man was here first, then came death. The evolution worldview clearly teaches millions of years of death, then came man. These two are opposite, folks. Evolution and creation are complete opposites. And there's only two ways we could have gotten here. Either we evolved or we created. There are no third choices. What that means then, since they are opposite, one of them is right, the other one has to be wrong. And again, we can remind you of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scriptures God breathed. It also says in John 17.17, 17, Thy word is truth. So we have God's word that it is true from beginning to end. But many Christians out there have been influenced by the world. Because of their lack of trust and faith in the Bible, they start believing parts of evolution and put it in. Now think of this. Rather than changing God's word, rather than being so quick to change God's word because of what man teaches, isn't it just possible, isn't it just possible that man's idea of evolution could be wrong? Why are we so quick to change the Bible and not take a look at what man is saying? I've, I'm under the belief that God's word is breathed by him and it is infallible. So our conclusion, did God use evolution? Well, both the Bible and logic clearly say no. As Christians, we are told to begin with God's word. Scripture should be our authority authority, and not man's wisdom. Well, that's our lesson for this week. Did God use evolution? And we saw the answer is clearly no. Now, Creation Training Initiative, we actually offer courses to help you understand this issue. We Again, we have four courses, our basic creation training class, which is a class one day long for teens and above. And in there, we train you how to defend the biblical model of creation. We train you how to refute evolution using both the Bible and science. We have an advanced creation apologetics course. This is a day and a half course. In there, we train you on how to use presuppositional apologetics as Jesus and Paul used in the Bible. We also show you that it doesn't take a degree in science to bring down the strongholds of evolutionism. Then we have a one-day Christian teacher training class. In this class, we show you how to use the methods that Jesus used to train up others. And we show you how to make Christian education not only life-changing, but the best education there is. And then finally, we have a five-day training class now called our Creation Apologetics Teachers College. Five days 
We bring in students from around the country, pastors, youth pastors, Christian school teachers, parents. We even accept college students and high school students. The purpose of this class is to equip you with the knowledge and the communication skills to go out and be able to teach about God's creation and teach about biblical apologetics with confidence. That is the purpose of that course. Now, if you'd like to find out more about these courses or how to bring one to your church or location, you can go to our website, creationtraining.org. That again is creationtraining.org. Or you can email us at info at creationtraining.org. So either way, you can get a hold of us. We want to thank you for listening to Creation Radio. Our next session will continue on in Chapter 1 of our Basic Creation Training class. And we're going to continue on with the Bible in time. And our subject will be the days of creation. How long were those days of creation? So we got an exciting topic out there. And finally, we do need and rely on a lot of prayer. We also rely on your financial support for our help so that we can take these courses around the country, even around the world, to do what the Bible tells us called biblical discipleship and train others up so they can go out and teach in their churches, in their Christian schools, and even other communities. We need your support. Even the smallest support, just $10, $20, or $30 or $40 a month, will help us continue with our mission to train up others so that they can go out and equip this next generation to be able to stand firm on their belief and trust in Jesus Christ, our Creator and Savior. Thank you, and God bless you.